Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today at the Minnesota Association for College Admission Counseling Virtual College Fair. We have some interesting information here. And before we get into that, I just have a couple of housekeeping items we wanted to go over very quickly. As a reminder, your camera and your microphone are off. The panelists cannot see or hear you. If you do have any questions, please utilize the Q&A button that you can see in the bottom of your screen down there. And feel free to ask questions at any time. Remember, you can also sign up for more sessions, check back and see what's being offered. There's still time to sign up. And lastly, a recording of this will be available as there are all of the sessions at strivescan.com slash Minnesota. And I'll drop that address in the chat in case you missed that. Again, feel free to ask questions on the Q&A. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Andrew from the University of St. Thomas. Thank you so much, Greg. I really appreciate everyone's time and being here to meet with me. You know, I really want to emphasize that you do ask those questions. One of my favorite things about working, the favorite thing to say about working with NCAA rules is there are no stupid questions. There really aren't. And so just drop them into the q and I'll just read the question and answer them as we go along. The other thing I like to kind of say with it is in terms of NCAA rules, if you had a Venn diagram of two circles, right? Um, common sense being one and NCAA rules being the other, a lot of times those don't overlap, right? There's not a shared space between those two. And so that's why questions are really important as we progress along through this. Um, if you don't, if you if something comes to you later, um, please feel free, and I'm gonna share my screen now in terms of my presentation. Please feel free to shoot me an email there at andrew-nelson at st. Thomas.edu. Um, I, I really enjoy being able to be a resource for everyone. And a real quick background uh, on my, you know, on what I do. I am the Associate Athletic Director of Compliance at the University of St. Thomas. Um, prior to that, you know, I started about a year ago as a part of our waiver getting approved for us to be the first school ever to go from division three to division one. <clears throat> My experience prior to that mostly was in division one at the University of Minnesota um, for nine years, uh, working with our football and men's and women's basketball, uh, men's, sorry, men's and women's hockey, and then baseball teams over there with the Gophers before coming to the University of St. Thomas. So a lot of my experience, a lot of this will talk about division one. Part of that is also because those are where the rules are a lot more intricate, a lot more sports specific rules in terms of dates and all of that. But that said, we will kind of jump right into our presentation here. All right, so we're gonna cover some definitions, right? Um, NCAA manual in terms of bylaw 13 recruiting alone has three plus pages of definitions that, you know, as you hear about deregulation in NCAA, it is a very thick book. And so a lot of that is just saying, this is what a prospect is. This is what recruiting is. And so we'll cover a bit of that and kind of go into then contacts and evaluations, recruiting materials, visits, offers, and then final, finally publicity um, of the recruiting side. Then we'll go into initial eligibility and I have the whole set of what is required in order for someone to be eligible for uh, at an athletic scholarship, practice and competition at the division one and two level. And then, um, there, and then we'll talk a little bit about division three throughout it. Um, one kind of recurring theme is with division three really is, is it's pretty deregulated. It's pretty wild, uh, pretty wild west. When I started at the university, University of St. Thomas, and we were still Division Three. Um, it was very surprising to me at, at how there really aren't any regulations surrounding a lot of the recruiting dates. It's if you want to go compete in Division Three, the coaches will talk to you, and, and eventually, if you choose Division Two or Division One, you know you, those dates fall by the wayside. But without further ado, um, well, before we get into definitions, right? So many recruiting rules. There's 65 pages in Division One by Law 13. Um, under 211, kind of the governing principles, and the NCAA is actually having a special convention this year where a lot of this might get deregulated, but certainly as you're being recruited now in the next academic year or two, these rules will very much be uh, still in place, and I imagine they will stay in place after any sort of restructuring of the NCAA. So recruiting rules are designed to promote equity among member institutions in the recruitment prospect, process and to shield prospects from undue pressures that may interfere with scholastic or athletic interests. Really, the way you see this play out is particularly to shield the prospects is in terms of dates tied to when a coach can, you know, email or text message or phone call a prospect or host them on an unofficial or official visit. A lot of times NCAA rules, especially recently, 
have been designed to uh, stop early recruiting. If you hear about an eighth grader or a ninth grader committing in a sport, NCAA rules really hope to achieve, you know, get around that. Why are coaches focusing on children who are, you know, children who are so young um, when it's five years until they actually go to college and, and certain women's sports? In terms of equity among member institutions, you see that in terms of limits on spending or limits on official visits, right? We don't want Alabama to out, be able to outspend everyone in football and, and get that far ahead. You, you um, there are certain le level playing fields and entertainment allowances, amounts you can spend on certain things and all of that. <clears throat> Division one, very, very many of these rules are sports specific. So I will, as we go through these, say the general date for this in division one is this. Um, but if you are in a sport such as men's basketball, softball, women's volleyball, um, a lot of women's basketball, football, right? A lot of those have their own sports specific rules because the coaches have gotten together and said, you know, in softball, our, we want to limit how much we recruit through club volleyball. So, sorry, club softball. So we're gonna limit the amount to evaluations doing club softball to these many days. And, and so you see that play out like that. Recruiting, all right. So you are being recruited by an NCAA coach if there is any solicitation by an institutional staff member, that coach or another staff member in the athletic program a booster or someone else for the securing for securing the purpose of the prospects enrollment and participation in athletics, right? Very straightforward. If we call you, if we send you a letter, if we send you a questionnaire, right? We are recruiting uh, you as a pr prospective student athlete or your child. Prospective student athlete, what is that? Well, a prospect is very, very large bucket, right? The definition covers a lot so that a lot of people fall into that definition of a prospective student athlete. And so, that includes anyone who has started classes for the ninth grade or anyone who has not started classes for ninth grade, but to whom the institution um, provides any benefits that does not provide to prospective students generally. So it, it, it can kind of be self-fulfilling if we target a seventh or eighth grader and provide them uh, complimentary admissions to a home basketball game. Well, that at the University of St. Thomas will trigger their status as a prospective student athlete. It's also important to note that uh, it's also important to note that for certain sports, again, there are sports specific bylaws that move this age up to seventh grade for the purposes of camps and clinics and tryouts. So men's basketball, softball, again, are some of those sports. I believe women's volleyball is about to be one of those sports as well. All right. So uh, once an individual becomes a prospective student athlete, they remain one until they officially register and enroll at a four-year institution or two-year institution. Um, participate in, the, and I'll also add an addendum to that, two-year students from the NCAA's perspective, then also our prospects as a two-year student with their own specific set of rules. Um, register and enroll at a four-year institution, participate in a regular squad practice or compete at a four-year institution, participate in orientation in the two weeks prior to the start of classes for the fall term, or a register a role and attend classes during the summer prior to an initial enrollment and then receive athletics aid. Certain sports, men's and women's basketball and football are allowed to provide athletics aid to incoming freshmen so that they can enroll in class and then participate in summer athletic activities. All right, so then moving on, a contact. A contact is any off-campus face-to-face counter um, with a dialogue in excess of an exchange of a greeting. That last bullet point is key. If you've ever paid attention to football recruiting or heard about anything with football recruiting, the term bump is very commonly used in terms of a coach bumping into a recruit and then having just a greeting. Um, there are certain conferences in the country that used to have a five minute rule with a bump where if a football coach or another coach um, bumped into a recruit who wasn't old enough to have that off-campus contact, it wouldn't start count as an off-campus contact uh, until after five minutes. Um, NCAA has really tried to crack down on those bumps and make sure that any dialogue, any actual face-to-face -face contact, a home visit, as you see with Coach Fleck and his staff, um, actually counts as a contact. So what are the timelines in, in, in terms of that? Oh, sorry, getting ahead of myself. Like we said, it, and I, I kind of already mentioned this, but it's a face-to-face -face counter dialogue in exchange of a greeting um, with that bump. 
uh, occurring, uh, you know, actually really counting as a contact. As I have in here, there is no such thing as a permissible bump. So if some coaches are trying to talk to you or, or, or your child prior to the permissible date that I'll have on the next slide, do note that that is potentially impermissible in Division One. Um, if it's pre-arranged face-to-face encounter, even if no conversation occurs, that would also count as a contact. Additionally, any encounter, you know, any face-to-face, -face, regardless of exchange of greeting or anything else, will count as a contact uh, for your child, for you uh, at your high school, at your educational institution, or where you are participating in a compass or competition or practice. Um, you know, even if it is unavoidable incidental contact at this site, then that technically counts as a contact. So what are the timelines for contacts? Well, division one, no off-campus contact can happen with a prospect until August 1 at the beginning of his or her junior year. Again, all those sports, baseball, football, the basketball, softball have different dates for that. Division two has kind of a more blanket rule in terms of June 15th after sophomore year. And as I alluded to earlier, division three, you know, if the division one manual is you know, five inches thick, division three is more like 1.5. And so there is no regulation on the timing for an off-campus contact with a prospect by division three coach. As I mentioned earlier, uh, if you end up attending a junior college or uh, your child does, uh, and then it ultimately gets recruited to division one or two, just note that unless they're a qualifier, and that's what we'll talk about in initial eligibility, but unless they're a qualifier, um, then there cannot be off-campus contact during that first year of school. And again, this gets back to the mission of, of these rules overall to make sure that we are not interfering with student athletes too soon, right? In, in, in terms of contacts in these states. And then also with the junior college rule and also the rules associated with practice or competition sites or their educational institution, making sure that, you know, if they're supposed to be focused on school, if they ended up at a junior college because academically they weren't ready for NCAA sports, we want to make sure we're not contacting them and distracting them from that school. You know, a lot of people roll their eyes at the phrase student athlete or, or the commercials that the NCAA puts out surrounding that. But there are a lot of rules there in place to make sure that coaches aren't interfering with their academics or, or their pursuit of their high school diploma or two year diploma. Um, and then the last one, transfer portal. And again, won't apply to anyone here yet. Right, but as we move forward, just note that the transfer portal in Division One is required uh, for student athletes to ultimately transfer from that institution they originally attend or, or their second institution. All right, moving on. So contacts and evaluations are kind of paired together in terms of what coaches do in terms of off-campus re recruiting. So an evaluation, very straightforward, right? Any activity, off-campus activity designed to assess the academic or athletics ability of a prospect. I don't have it on this slide because it's not as relevant to this audience, but for my coaches, I always remind them that anytime they visit a high school, technically, and there's limits for our coaches on the numbers of evaluations and contacts that can occur off campus, that counts as an evaluation for everyone at that high school. And then other sports have specific rules surrounding how often a coach can visit a high school. So um, note that coaches, you know, a lot of times if they're, you're their top prospect, they certainly would watch you um, every day, every game, right? As much as they could to kind of show that interest, but it is limited to number and um, and certainly recruiting calendars as well. An evaluation can occur at any age, right? If we have eighth graders playing on playing up on varsity and a coach goes to a, a game and watches them, that technically is an evaluation for everyone at that contest, similarly with the visit to a high school. So no age limit here, just note that, you know, but I think it's just important to note that Coaches are limited in the time spans that they can evaluate and also on the number of times they can evaluate a prospect before they sign with that institution. All right, so moving on to communications uh, in terms of we've had off-campus recruiting and now are the different types of ways that coaches can recruit with prospects. Really the most popular one is, I say printed recruiting materials, but this, pull, this bylaw also pulls in sending emails, text messages, and private social medias on uh, uh, social media. So 13.4, this whole area, this whole set is really the way that people communicate nowadays. And I, and I used to joke that it was high schoolers, but, uh, or college students really only communicate by text message, but you know that's the case with 80% of the people mostly texting, right? As opposed to phone calls. So it, this is a big area of emphasis in terms of modern NCAA rules and recruiting. 
All right, so um, in terms of hard correspondence, general correspondence, there are no restrictions on the design or content, um, as long as it's not eight and a half and 11 when opened by full. Um, you know, on the previous slide, I have him in a bathtub of letters. Here we see a family's living room complete, the floor completely covered with hard mail sent by programs. Um, I, having worked with a Big Ten football program, I know that this is still a really big thing, right? Is as you get recruited and become a higher level pro or your child becomes a higher level priority for that program, they will certainly overwhelm you uh, with printed recruiting materials. So just note that there's a size limit to that. But beyond that, the content and the design aspects and Photoshopping, or if they send you nine, eight and a half by 11s and they're numbered one through nine and you can arrange them into a poster, that's all permissible. And, and I've seen variations on kind of almost all of this. Big thing that would be a restriction is anything of value, right? They can't send you um, a printed recruiting material on a gold plate coin or, or something similar. It, it sounds silly. But the questions that or the hypotheticals that come up as coaches get paranoid about what other schools are doing are, are pretty are pretty funny. All right, so electronic transmissions. This pulls in any sort of digital communication um, between a prospect and a coach. So this is text messages, instant messages, um, private social media messages. We'll get to publicity in a little bit, but public recruiting is not permissible. So private social media message. Um, video or audio materials, uh, including gifts, right? Anything that is attached to it um, can be made for recruiting purposes, right? They can have a specific recruiting video that they send out to prospects, but typically these videos, um, at least in division one and two, cannot be personalized with a prospect's personal information, right? So if it's a GIF of uh, your child or you as you play and they send it to you with, you know, the University of Nebraska red N dropping in on it and Photoshop that in, that would be technically impermissible. Uh, same with video audio materials, you cannot provide hard copies. That then turns into a tangible benefit, which NCAA rules typically don't want. And that leads into the next bullet point. Um, in terms of recruiting. So when I say tangible benefits, right, this could include posters, um, printed media guides, uh, schedule maintenance, anything that if you went to the fan shop, you know, the Tommy shop at the University of St. Thomas, or you come to our football game against Valparaiso this Friday or Saturday, and, and you buy one of these things, that then obviously can't be sent to you. And, and I think a good rule of thumb is it falls outside of that size perspective or is a little different likely there is a potential violation uh, um, with that. Mm -hmm. Also note, you know, that just overall that these items cannot be provided by an athletic program to a high school. So you reach out to a football program or anyone like that for a scheduled poster or something like that, then that would also be an impermissible tangible benefit to the high school or the coach that reached out for it. So when, you know, kind of the big one is when can these be sent? And we have an Another photo of a prospect with all these letters. Fun fact about this photo is that's Juju Smith-Schuster. So this is when he was like a sophomore in high school. And now he's been a uh, Pro Bowl receiver, played on the Steelers, all of that. So June 15th, after the prospects, sophomore year, most sports in D1 and D2. Um, was a couple sports moved that date up somewhat into the sophomore year. And then D3, anytime. Again, Wild West in terms of regulations there. So as you're being recruited, if you're prior to this age, um, note that that's when it will open up after that age. Note that as you receive these materials, these mailings, these text messages, the direct messages on Twitter, then that is permissible under these rules. I have specific sports specific rules. Uh, you know, some back it up to September 1 of junior year. Men's basketball moves it up, uh, actually has that June 15th date, and then men's hockey moves it up to January 1. A sophomore year. Again, sport culture is recognized in Division One rules. If coaches get together, men's hockey coaches association gets together and says, "Hey, you know, we are identifying prospects very early, and we kind of want to get open that conversation from January one of their sophomore year," and then that's why you see these rules pass. All right, I'll just pause real quick before we go into visits, and again, just you know, encourage any questions uh, in the question and answer panel. We'll be happy to kind of announce it and answer it for the group. If you're thinking it, you're probably not the only one. All right, so recruiting visits. We have two types of visits. We have the official visit, and really it should be capitalized, right? The official visit, only one per school, uh, only five total in Division One, um, And so that is the big visit. That's the one that is financed in part 
or whole by the institution. So train airfare for the prospective student athlete in the sports of basketball and football, airfare for their parents, um, right? Then once you get on campus, lodging, meals, uh, this includes up to four family members once you get on campus. So this is where it's really, you know, especially um, high budget, right? Power five programs go all out in terms of this official visit. Other schools absolutely will as well in terms of, you know, getting into campus, providing those meals, all of that. Non official visit then is when it's financed by the prospect. And this can be as simple as you or your child receiving complimentary admissions to a home athletics event for, for that team. Um, and, and there really is no limit on the number in most sports on the number of unofficial visits. But um, as we said, you know, pays all the transportation, meals, lodging out of their own pocket. One exception to the expense that you can receive is the complimentary admissions to a home athletics event. Beyond that, kind of self financing. Um, self financing for that. I'm going to pause real quick here uh, and answer a question. Um, so the qu question was, um, how do you get a recruiter to come to your school? Uh, we're not, and, and these kind of questions are really common in, in these sessions with parents of another similar one that I get beyond a, how do you get a recruiter to come to your school is how do you get, you know, someone to recruit your child, right? Or how do you get them on someone's radar? When I worked at the University of Minnesota, my common answer, and it really is the same working at the University of St. Thomas, is for almost all sports, particularly individual sports, our coaches will find you or, or will find your child, right? Uh, especially at the division one level, um, as our coaches recruit in their area, they have connections to club coaches or high school coaches, and, and we'll speak to them and try to figure out who the right fit is for the program. You know, the Big Ten School, University of Minnesota, you know, they, that is certainly even more true, right? Where they not only kind of know who they're looking for, they make a list of their top recruits and target them and let the rest kind of fall by the wayside. Very similar division one for the University of St. Thomas. Um, if you do want your high school coach who's connected to it, to um, the college coach, you can certainly recommend that they come to the high school and recruit them, but most of the time, college coaches have an idea of the type of player, type of student athlete, type of student they're recruiting and they will, you know, use the resources that they have to find them. Um, doesn't hurt though, always to send an email. You always hear stories about that. If you have highlight tapes um, for team sports, right? Or game film, something like that. Um, you can certainly forward that along to coaches and it's at their discretion, right? Whether or not they're gonna view it. For individual sports, uh, I've seen our women's golf coach respond to someone saying, hey, this is who I am. These are my scores. And then our individual coaches have, I, you know, what level of tournament was this? What was the rating of the course? How many tournaments have you played where you scored in the top 20? And so on. Same for women's tennis, same. And then even more so for sports where, where your time in terms of track and field and swimming and diving, you know, that, that clock doesn't lie. And so as you look to get recruited, I certainly think it is important to try to get materials out, especially if you're interested in a program, but just know it's a two-way street and a lot of times even a one-way street as we get into those bigger programs and they less recruit and more select. So very good question. Thank you for asking. All right. So then keeping on with unofficial visits, um, the timing for that uh, typically um, is sports specific for division one. Um, September 1 of, of junior year is something you've typically seen. Again, men's hockey has moved that up. Men's basketball has moved it up a little bit. Um, and you can kind of see it sports specifically. Unlimited, as I mentioned, in all sports, but basketball, uh, men's and women's basketball do have specific time limitations. If you're a prospect in one of those sports, do work with your recruiting coach on, on the potential for that time. D2, again, that June 15th date uh, after sophomore year, and then D3 anytime. If you want to go on campus and talk to a Division three coach and you're a freshman or a sophomore, that will typically be permissible. Um, transportation, one exception in terms of the transportation that can be provided um, to practice in competition sites and competition at any local site must be, I say, in the St. Thomas, but in an institutional, if you're getting recruited by Wisconsin, in a Badger vehicle or a coach's vehicle or a team vehicle, um, they cannot pay any other transportation fees. Uh, including parking. In Division Two, 
you are allowed to receive one meal, I believe, on an unofficial visit. Um, but beyond that, it's similar with limited on what can be provided. Additionally, um, you can have uh, coaches can have off campus contact within one mile campus during an unofficial visit. So if you go on an unofficial visit, attend a game, afterwards go out to eat, you know, a half mile from campus or a few blocks from campus, that is certainly permissible on an unofficial visit. All right, so moving on from uh, visits then to offers, I, I will note that I, I don't have the slides for the dates for official visits on there. Just note that with an official visit, that date typically is that same of that junior or senior year, and then they are limited to one per school and five per student athlete. This is the same between D1 and D2, and then Division Three doesn't have official visits. So. Just note that, you know, then as you go through that, the, there are restrictions in terms of the amount of money that can be provided for entertainment. And then they can, again, provide meals, uh, transportation, all of that, really no limit on the meals and transportation that can be provided beyond that. Um, it's nothing, you know, five star beyond what a normal person riding, you know, normal airfare would incur. All right. So, um, you know, through all this recruiting, right, ultimately the goal is for you to end up with an offer of either a spot on a team or in Division One or Division Two of an athletic scholarship. In terms of the dates surrounding those offers, I, I do think it is important to note that a written offer of athletic aid can only happen after September 1 of a prospect senior year. So if you're getting an email or what famously happened was an Oklahoma football coach direct message several prospects on Twitter and said, hey, we're offering you a full ride scholarship. And they were, you know, of the permissible age to receive such a message, but not September 1 of senior year. That is impermissible. A verbal offer of a spot on a team or just a verbal offer can occur pretty much at any time. There's only one sport in terms of women's hockey that, or I'm sorry, men's hockey that regulates when that verbal offer can come. All other sports, it, it can happen at any time. The thing is, is with those recruiting timelines, right? If you can't send a message until um, July 1 after sophomore year or, or whatever the sports date is, and you can't text or call prior to that either, then ipso facto, right? A verbal offer can't be made uh, prior to that time. If an offer was made by a high school coach or a club coach, you can't use those coaches to pass along communication to a prospect who's not of age. So. The, those rules are also meant to prevent written or verbal offers occurring prior to that time. A lot of this is built around the fact that in sports like women's volleyball, women's soccer, um, softball, even you're seeing commitments of uh, uh, men's hockey, um, you're seeing commitments of kids who are in seventh or eighth grade. Uh, and, and overall, as a whole, NCAA rules really do try to get away from that and, and limit when that offer occurs. That said, D3, again, the deregulated world of D3, that offer can occur at any time. All right, so then publicity. Just kind of important for you to know that all this communication, all this talk of a co between a coach and a prospect really should be uh, private, right? It should not, coaches cannot publicly talk about prospects or their likelihood of them committing um, it really puts coaches in awkward positions if they're asked by the media of that. Note that this also includes on social media. So coaches then can't create posts that include an app mention or write on a prospect's wall or comment on a photo on Instagram. Um, also, you can't, the coaches can't really use nicknames or get too tricky about this. They can't allude to the person or the prospect or your child, right, if they're using their name or nickname their location, their jersey number, it, it drills down even to saying what state they're from. So ultimately, um, a coach couldn't post on Twitter, hey, we got better today with a commitment from the state of Minnesota and hashtag, if the kid's name is meatloaf, this is the example that you, NCAA used a couple of years ago, hashtag eating meatloaf, something like that. That's obviously alluding to that prospect and publicizing that recruitment. Additionally, a coach can't endorse a prospect's team or athletics facility, facility primarily used by prospects. The exceptions, right? Click, don't type. Coaches can click, but not type. They can indicate approval, they can like, and they can also share something without adding a comment to it. Um, you know, that's the big rule for coaches is not to add that comment or comment on something like that. 
once a prospect signs a national letter of intent, that's what that NLI stands for, or, or if you're not receiving athletic aid, it would be something more akin to an acceptance of admission, then these restrictions go away and coaches can talk at a press conference or publicize that recruit that recruitment of a prospect. Note that coaches do get clever a little bit in terms of being able to click something and then after that comment on it, as long as it doesn't specifically reference the prospect. So um, in my time at the U, um, the University of Minnesota, you know, Coach Patino, when he was there, uh, would say, you know, we got better today, would retweet a commitment, and then right after that say, we got better today, and used all the permissible hashtags that don't reference the location, jersey number, or nickname, or anything personal, personally identifiable information of that prospect. So that's one kind of loophole that coaches find around that, but overall that publicity is not permissible. All right. So we are now leaving recruiting in the sphere and the timelines for all that and what that looks like. Ultimately, you know, the last thing would be signing in terms of that, signing national letter intent or signing acceptance of admission in division one or division two. Big thing then, and where we're gonna focus these last, you know, 10 minutes or so of this presentation is initial eligibility. These are all the items that as an incoming freshman, you, need, you would need to complete or do in order to be eligible for aid practice and competition. So division one and division two have these similar core course requirements. 16, we'll go over the specific number, what's included in that 16 um, in order to be eligible your first year at a division one or two institution. Division three does not have these requirements. As long as you are regularly admitted as a full-time undergraduate student, as a freshman to your school, you will be eligible initially in division three. Really important to this and it's something that has been a big headache for me, honestly, as we go from division three to division one is in division three, you don't have to register with the eligibility center. Division two and division one, both the certified final amateurism and certify this initial academic eligibility, you will need to register with the eligibility center. So if you know you're gonna to go to division one or division two, I would highly recommend that you register during your junior year um, and then get those six semester transcripts in. Um, uh get those six semester transcripts in this will allow if you have if you have a good enough academic record you to be certified as a final qualifier and i'll talk about what that means a little bit uh prior to graduation it just makes you sleep a lot easier in terms of eligibility for that uh, i see a question i will answer that real quick uh, at the end of this slide uh, so just know and this is where the headache's been for me for our current student athletes going division three to division one, they actually have to register with the eligibility center to get amateurism certified. And um, they are not happy about this fee, but there is a fee to register with the eligibility center, $90 for domestic students. Uh, if it's an international student coming from an international school, that is $150. Do note, and I, I've kind of buried this, that the test center code for the eligibility center and for transcripts is 999. Uh, just kind of important to make a note of that. If you are an international student or have attended an international school, note that it, you will need to submit that documentation from the international school and it could cause some unique circumstances. Also note, same thing for homeschooling, right? If there's been a portion of your high school that's been homeschooling, they will require documentation surrounding that homeschooling in order to certify initial eligibility. Quick question. Um, here is do coaches use scouting services like prep baseball report or perfect game? Yes, typically coaches, uh, all programs, if they're available, will use those types of scouting services. And it's kind of like, you know, all the information on prospects, right, is a bit of a fire hose of information. And so they do have certain reports or resources that they do like to use. I, I can't speak across the board of what all coaches use. I know that they use different systems, but those types of um, scouting services are used to and subscribed by coaches in almost all sports uh, in the sports that they exist in. So thank you very much. That is a great question. All right. So division one and division two initial eligibility. What, what do I mean by when, what are we going for here? Right. What's the goal? Well, the goal is to be a final academic qualifier. Um, and ultimately, this means that you are eligible for aid practice and competition. This requires 16 core courses total uh, with subject requirements. We'll go over the subject requirements on the next slide. Um, with 10 of those 16 completed prior to the start of their senior year, um, with those locking in, and seven of the 10 successfully completed courses must be in English, math, and natural physical science. Real quick on that, the re way this 10 and seven of the 10 number came about was 
lot of times student athletes would complete their um, junior year of high school and not be anywhere close to being a qualifier. Nowhere, you know, seven core courses, something like that. Lo and behold, their senior year, they complete 10 core courses and all A's and had never gotten an A before. This just looked fishy and kept happening and happening again. And, and the NCAA is in no place to police academic fraud at the high school level. And, and as such, they kind of put this benchmark in saying, no, you need to normally progress through high school at, to this extent in order to, to have at least 10 core courses prior to your senior year in order to be eligible for competition as a freshman. And then last thing to note is a 2.3 minimum core GPA is required. Those who do not achieve the 10 prior to seventh semester or uh, fall below 2.3 and are above a 2.0 ultimately be an academic redshirt in division one and a partial qualifier in division two. What this means is that, that they are eligible for aid and practice but not competition, right? And so you've heard of a redshirt year where someone doesn't compete. This is kind of a forced academic redshirt year to make sure that, you know, same with the junior college prospect. If you're not fully that qualifier status, we want you to be as close as possible to spend a year focusing on school. You can still practice, but not compete and then get that eligibility for competition. Non-qualifier, what we ultimately don't want, right? And also note that if you're not certified as a qualifier, ultimately after high school graduation and you enroll, that does mean that more or less you are a non-qualifier. Not a qualifier equals non-qualifier. And that means that the division one and two level cannot practice, compete, or receive aid. Division three, again, none of this exists. You will be eligible as long as you're admitted. All right, so the subject, uh, core subject requirements for division one require four years of English core courses, two years of social science, three years of math, um, two years of natural science, one lab if available, then one additional English, math, natural science, and four additional core courses. I have this on a later slide, but really important that you note really the biggest thing of initial eligibility. Note that the NCAA approves these core courses, not the high school. So as you progress through high school, make sure you're talking to your counselor and that these are listed on the NCAA approved core course list. All high schools kind of have a designated counselor that works with the NCAA keeps this list updated. So as you go through school and you take potentially a remedial class or your child takes a remedial class, note that this might not uh, meet the NCAA core course requirements. Um, post high school, uh, just real quick, a, a PSA can take one additional core course to rectify any deficiency. You have an educational impacting disability on EID, you can take three core courses post-graduation. Just note that even with that EID, you still need to be taking courses that are approved by the NCAA as core courses. Um, and this must be all completed prior to full-time collegiate enrollment. Uh, additionally, if, you, if a prospect, if your child is taking that summer course or those three courses, and they are uh, set to receive aid for summer school in those sports of football and men's, ba men's, women's basketball, um, that they cannot take those courses while they are receiving that aid. All right. Real quick to division two, um, similar setup, but the numbers are just a little different. Instead of four years of English, it's three years of English. Same with two years of social science, two years, and then the th instead of three years of math, it's only two years of math uh, with two years of natural science, the same as division one. And so that year we chopped off of English, that year we chopped off of math, those get added to the additional English, math, and natural science, where in division two, there are three additional English, math, and natural science, as opposed to the one in division one, still 16 core courses and still the four additional core. I will note that typically the four additional core includes foreign language courses, but anything else that doesn't fall into those subject areas, a lot of times will not fall into an additional core course. Thinking of at, a, you know, if you're at a Catholic or a Christian school and your child takes religion each year, typically those will not be included on the approved core course list, same with accounting, uh, other type business sorts of courses. All right, we are near the end. I have just a couple slides. If anyone wants to get a buzzer beater of a question in, uh, I, I would encourage that now. All right, test scores. Uh, we are in limbo with test scores for initial eligibility. I will, big thing of emphasis is for fall 22 will not be required for initial eligibility. So if you are entering college or set to enter college in fall 22 and your school's not requiring an ACT or SAT, um, then just note that the NCAA will not require it either. So do not take it if you feel like you would have to do it per NCAA rules. Um, 
Also note that moving forward, the NCAA is evaluating whether or not to use test scores at all. As more and more schools, especially after the pandemic, go test optional, the NCAA is, pro and you know, certain things emerge, uh, including implicit racial biases and standardized testing. The NCAA is heavily considering to move away from testing beyond 2022. If they keep it, just note that it uses a sum score. So on your ACT, it takes all the subscores and gets to a sum score. So if you see uh, it, an ACT score for NCAA eligibility and it's something like 62, that makes sense because it's really just the four subscores added up to get to that 62, you know, average about 15 per subscore, right? Um, and note that in order to be used for initial eligibility, if that is something moving forward beyond fall, you know, for fall 23 or beyond, it would be the test would be required to be taken prior to initial full time collegiate enrollment. All right, just note uh, real quick, fly through this. Just if you earn 16 quarter courses and have a two three, that gets you eligible now. That's how the test score is not used. Um, if you're you can be an early academic qualifier if you have 14 quarter courses prior to seventh semester with over a 3.0 GPA. So. Um, these COVID-19 waivers, and this is in effect for this year, given everything with, uh, you know, being able to not take the test or take the test or adjustments to the test, um, these are applicable moving on from fall 22. All right. So real, real quick, I've got one minute left. Just note, if you've been to one more, one or more high school, you need to get each of those academic transcripts in. Um, the current high school can send copies of uh, all transcripts. Um, but it must come individually from the school and be official, right? Really important that same with submitting it to a college, official high school transcript um, from each high school attended. If it is an international student athlete or you spend time at an international school, note that you must have your English language transcript along with the native language, sorry, English language translation along with the native language transcripts, both official. Um, if you start an international, that's fine. I have seen this happen a ton. They'll use the freshman sophomore year from Australia, pair it with junior and senior year here in the States and get you eligible. Delayed enrollment. If you delay enrollment more than one year in all sports but men's hockey, just note that you can't compete that year without getting charged a season of competition. Men's hockey has a 21 year old rule for delayed enrollment. You can compete up to age 21. Beyond that, you get charged that season of competition uh, if you compete in hockey. Whew, right on time at 4.45 here with Greg. I see no open questions. Um, so I really appreciate, uh, here, I'll stop the share, pop on real quick. I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, and just again, andrew-nelson at stthomas.edu for any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for a lot of great information. And thank you everyone for visiting with us today. When you close this window, you'll get a link to a very quick, short five question survey and we'd appreciate any feedback that you could provide. We encourage you to check back on the schedule to see if there's any other sessions that you're interested in. And remember that a recording of this session as well as all of the sessions uh, can be found on strivescan.com slash Minnesota. Thank you everyone and have a great night.